The future of good journalism hangs in the balance for a whole plethora of reasons. And many people feel that its future depends on the professionalism of those who practice the craft. At the core of this uncertainty is the issue of journalism education and the sustainability of ethical, independent journalism that can push back the tide of disinformation to best serve democracy. So who better to talk on this topic than my guest today, Paula Frey. Paula has worked in media for more than three decades as journalist, editor, and media trainer. She was the first woman editor of the Saturday Star newspaper in South Africa and currently runs Frey College of Communication, a pan-African media training organization. I'm Gwen Lister, host of this NMT Free Speak podcast in which we discuss all things media. So welcome, Paula, and thanks so much for joining. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to hear you. Uh, Paula, let me dive right into it and start with a question perhaps pertaining to you and I as two of the, what we might call the old guard of journalism. I'm not sure about you, but I'd never had any training before I embarked on a career in journalism in 1976, and I've not had any since. It was a case of baptism of fire and learning as I went along. I do recall that back in those days, bigger print media took on cub reporters to learn the craft on the job, and they'd start by doing really menial tasks. And I guess they developed, or they didn't, as there wasn't much formal training as such. What's different, in your view, in the field of training from then to now? Thanks, Gwen. So, you know, I graduated from Rhodes University with a journalism degree in the early 80s. And then I went on to complete the August Cadet School. Um, it's now independent newspapers. Um, and so while there were not a lot of short courses available when I started out in journalism, um, we were really operating in a newsroom where there were lots of senior journalists. And so after the cadet school, there was still a lot of on-the-job training. Um, you were learning through a process of mentorship, um, you know, and, and, and senior journalists. Um, and so the on-the-job training is really you learning from the people around you. And I think one of the biggest changes that we're seeing now is that capacity building is actually happening outside of the newsroom. And so rather than journalists learning on the job or learning from more senior um, um, journalists, they really are going to a lot more short courses or they're learning um, from, from online courses, etc. Right. I think the other thing that's happening is that the pace of change um, um, is so much faster now and the expectations are much higher than we've had before. So journalists are really in an environment where, where the daily grind of journalism sometimes hampers the ongoing learning as well. Exactly. And, and you know, that leads into what I wanted to talk about next. And that is, of course, you've said it already, things have changed a lot over the decades. We started out in those days with a pen notebook and an unwieldy manual camera and did all our work on typewriters. And of course, the digital age has made things a lot easier for journalists in a certain sense with all the new tools at their disposal, but also much more difficult. Um, and it's certainly a far more complex work environment, as you've now said currently, than back in the 70s and 80s. Would you like to talk a little bit more about how it's changed, Paula? It's a lot more complex. I don't think we can consider ourselves um, only as print or only radio or only television reporters anymore. I think increasingly journalists need to be multi-platform storytellers. And right. while we need more technical skills than ever before, we also need more analytical and critical thinking skills because the story is no longer as straightforward as it was, certainly not when I came out into journalism. Exactly. And of course, you know, your career, call it that, in training, you've been involved since 2005. So compared to what you did back in those years, when traditional media, for example, was still flourishing, how are your training programs different now? How have you adapted them to this new digital world? So we've always focused on advanced journalism skills training. When we started in 2005, we really started with the narrative journalism training um, because we recognized that there were, while there were many entry-level courses, we were losing mid-level journalists and, and we wanted to find new ways of them to be able to tell stories. So we focused on advanced skills. But we've seen fundamental shifts in delivery, in funding, and in focus when it comes to training. So we've seen a shift actually from newsroom-funded programs to partner-funded um, programs. So more and more donors 
are actually funding training programs for journalism. Okay. We've also, yeah, we've also seen, right, I mean, clearly you, you mentioned before, there's a change in the kinds of things that we were training um, around. So 10 years ago, data journalism, verification tools, social media training, multi-platform storytelling weren't really on the agenda. And today they're almost amongst our core skills. And then the last thing that we've seen a shift in has really been a shift in the delivery of the training. Um, we were fortunate because we began exploring online training before the pandemic struck. And so now what we've done is escalate our online training and expanded our e-learning courses. Um, but really what we're looking at is a hybrid of face-to-face -face online e-learning but also a more holistic approach in terms of that journalism training is not just in terms of these interactions, but also the resources we make available, um, even for self-learning for reporters. Absolutely. So many different ways to train journalists. And what I wanted to just mm -hmm. follow up and ask you on that, Paula, is I think online in the present pandemic world is one that's probably working best for us. But do you need to tweak your models, call them that, to suit the requirements in different countries? Have you got a specific formula that you have found works best? And also, how has COVID-19 affected your approach to training, if at all? So, so one of the things that we do, before we do any training, and then we always start off with a skills audit. Right. Um, and, and the reason for that is to actually, we're actually meeting real needs rather than simply kind of doing um, the same old, same old right. um, when it comes to journalism training. Our preference is for longer term training. I mean, sh short courses work when you're trying to teach a specific skill. So, for example, if you're trying to teach people how to do reverse picture uh, um, searches um, in the verification processes, then a short course will certainly work. But if you're trying to get people to use reverse um, picture searches, um, in, in their day-to-day -day journalism, then that's a different um, a process altogether. Right. Then you almost want to be working with them over a longer period of time. So our preference really is for longer um, a format that include coaching where possible, but also to try and integrate self-learning into the process. Um, COVID-19 has meant less travel for us and more online training, yes. but it's also allowed us to deepen our expanded footprint. And so we've been able to train across the continent, um, in the Middle East, as well as Southeast Asia. In fact, at the moment, I think we've got about more than 100 women from seven African countries enrolled on our media management course. Um, and we're expecting about 30 to 50 um, women from Southeast Asia to join that in the next month. And so you can imagine the dynamic interaction between the women from all the different countries actually talking about their challenges of being media managers. I think that's amazing, Paula, and a, and a very exciting development, I think. And I look forward to hearing more about that in the future because it, it, it really sounds very good. But I'm also, I think, you know, one of those, I don't know if I'm a dinosaur, but in that sense, but a, a person who feels we need to go back to basics as a critical foundation for good journalism. And I mean, nowadays there are others who disagree and say, look, it's not about the basics any longer. It's about equipping journalists with specialist skills and multitasking abilities. Where do you fit into on this spectrum of points? I think you can, I'm probably a dinosaur with you, <laughs> but I think that good journalism starts with, with a solid foundation. Right. And, and, and then we build on that, right? But apart from basic skills, I mean, one of the things that we also advocate for is critical thinking skills. Right. Um, because what we want are journalists that, that, not, that don't, don't only have the technical skills, but also have the critical and analytical skills to be able to make sense of the story for their audiences. And, and it probably makes sense to, to talk about the need for new skills, but keeping old values. Your thoughts absolutely. on that? Yes, um, I mean, absolutely. I think journalism is a sector in disruption. And so we need strong value-based journalism with an ability to adapt to ever-changing platforms. I certainly think that future for journalists are not only comfortable with change, but they also embrace it in order to serve the public. Exactly. And Paula, nowadays, not only do journalists have to do their regular work, if one can refer to it as such, in other words, the business of reporting, but they also have a very key role to play in trying to stem the tsunami of disinformation, the infodemic, as it's sometimes termed in this era of global pandemic. Do you think that this is diverting media's attention from their core function of informing their audiences, or is it now an intrinsic part of their job description? You know, I, I certainly believe that fact-checking is core to our regular right. work. Right. In that we need to 
create a space where our audiences know that they will find verified information in this, what you call a tsunami of misinformation and disinformation. I always tell our trainees that what we as professional journalists sell is our credibility. You know, people don't buy the newspaper um, because they're buying the news. They've already found the news on social media. People buy news in newspapers or behind paywalls because they trust us. They buy the verified, credible information. And we as journalists can never undermine that, which makes fact-checking an essential skill for any journalist in this day and age. Absolutely. A, a very important thing. And even though fact-checking itself has kind of become an industry, if you like, separate from journalism, it's still absolutely critical because at the end of the day, I think, I mean, obviously fact-checking is a core mm. function of the journalist, him or herself. Paula, at the end of the day, whatever form a story takes, um, news reports for a newspaper, a script for a podcast or a video, radio report, journalism is about obviously good writing skills. Are the roles of reading and research as important now as they were in the past? It's interesting, you know, because a lot of journalists think of their, their role as writing the story. But in fact, it's right from the beginning in terms of the story ideas that they generate, the stories that they choose, the way they research it, the way they actually pull the information together, um, and, and then finally the way they write it. I think that the reading and research is more important than ever for the simple reason that we live in an information era with an overwhelming amount of data. And so the journalist who adds value is the one that can actually adequately curate the information in that they are able to identify what dots of information really matter for the audience. Right. And then they're able to join those dots together in a way that allows us to see their importance. Um, so yes, I think reading and research is as important now as it's ever been, if not more so. I know, I, you know, in some of the mentoring I've done and even sort of talking to students at our local polytechnic and, and university, I found that so many young trainee journalists simply aren't reading anymore. Is this something yeah. you find is also a bit of a problem? And I do think, mm -hmm. you know, they lack the necessary depth, I try to point out to them, mm -hmm. because one of the things journalists need is a darn good general knowledge. And that's somehow lacking if they themselves mm. are being sort of attracted to the clickbait rather than getting down mm. to it and reading as much as they can. You really don't see why stories are important if you don't have extensive general knowledge. But more importantly, if you also aren't digging deeper into issues, right? right. I mean, it's, it's, anyone can have general knowledge about COVID, but if you truly want to be understanding what's happening around the vaccine, around vaccine inequity, um, vaccine apartheid, you need to do a bit more reading than the average person so that you can actually see what information has value for your audiences. I really wish, um, um, Gwen, I, that, that journalists read more, um, did some of the hard work before they came up with story ideas of really thinking through stories, Absolutely. thinking through potential ideas. Yes, no, I fully agree with you, Paula. And as I said, it is a message, I think, that one keeps on having to put out there. Um, and I know I, I tried to do that with a lot of my young trainees and it's a difficult thing, you know, mm -hmm. even just because I always say that journalism is underpinned really by writing. And so a lot of my men mentorees, I used to give a, a dictionary to them and say what I did when mm. I was a young kid was actually have a dictionary next to my bed. And when I read my mother's library books mm. at a very young age, I'd sort of look up the words and every night try and at least learn a few more words or the way that they used. Because I think language, whatever language we write in or do journalism in, needs to be given the respect it deserves. Yes, absolutely. Uh, even just, you know, as, as basic as the preciseness of the meaning of words. I think we, we, we're very laissez-faire like, about that. And so sometimes when we are writing stories, we're not really thinking about the language we're using or even our own tropes or what we're reinforcing or not reinforcing. Um, by the way, we structure our, our sentences, our words, even the angles we choose. Right. I think I would really love to encourage journalists to do, to do really in depth thinking about about the profession, that it's not simply a matter of we come to the park and we write stories and we walk away. But we really are adding something um, of great value. Um, I believe in journalism as a public good. Um, and I really think um, and in order to ensure that we live up to that mandate, 
that we are really treating it respectfully. We're absolutely on the same page there, Paula. Maybe a difficult question that I'm still trying to answer for myself, and that is, given your wealth of experience of media over the years, do you think that journalists are born or can they be made? So I don't think that journalists are, are, are really right. I think journalism starts actually with that motivation to serve the public um, and that, that understanding that what we do is a public good and essential tool for democracy. And I think that if you have that approach, then the, the skills can actually follow. I think that if you are driven by the desire to seek the truth as fully as possible, then the skills can be taught. I mean, you, you know, TikTok, for example, is full of people who share information in very interesting ways. Yes. Is that journalism? I don't, I'm not sure that it is, right? And just to be clear, I think that when it's put to happen on a platform like TikTok, but simply sharing information doesn't make you a journalist. Um, I do think that in the future, though, that we're going to see journalism as the um, product of teams of people rather than simply as the product of one person. And we're going to be be training um, people as teams rather than just as individuals. That's interesting, Paula. I look forward to seeing how that, but in a sense, I suppose that's working already with this, a lot of the Mm cross-border investigative journalism that's happening, uh, you know, globally and on the African continent. Paula, maybe just Mm -hmm. to follow on that question, some people see a schism developing between those solid writers and journalists with limited digital skill sets on the one hand, and those multimedia journalists who great with video, good technicians, for example, but you can't really grasp how to work a beat or dig as deeply in terms of investigative abilities. What do you think? Is there, is there kind of a different journalism emerging or different strains of journalism, put it that way? So one of the big changes that we're seeing is, is the constant discussion that's happening across the globe, actually, of journalism as a product. Um, And and so that's why I often talk about feminism happening with teams now, because you are finding that there is a divide between older journalists who have the knowledge and the skills in order how to write the story and younger journalists who have the technical skills. Um, But you're finding collaborative journalism, not just in investigation, but also in telling stories across platforms So journalists coming together and using their skills to be able to tell their stories in different ways, in different platforms, um, in different formats. I think there is a danger, a danger that the digital divide really uh, allows some journalists to get access to, to skills that allows them to tell sure. stories um, um, in, uh, digitally and in formats that, that appeal to younger people um, and not necessarily to be able to tell the skills that, that appeal to older people. And I think that newsrooms need to be mindful of who their audiences are and that we're not becoming little echo chambers talking to the same people because we're using the same stories and the same format all the time, that we're constantly looking to expand not only our storytelling abilities, but also in doing so, our audiences. Absolutely important. One of the things I know I also tell my trainees is know your communities or those that you serve. Um, And Mm -hmm. that's the best way to, as you say, because there are different groups of people with different interests. Um, And so it's important really to be in touch and keep in touch. Paula, I wonder if you could speak to this fact. And, and, you know, I often think that the general public out there and a lot of people often don't really understand the huge swathe of skills and competencies that journalists are expected to have. You know, most people do a job and it's fairly simple. If they're a bank clerk, they need to understand banking or finance, but journalists are expected to know it all. I had a look the other night at Pointer's 37 core skills for journalists, and really it's quite mind-boggling from having the right characteristics, and I think both you and I agree that those characteristics are still important, of curiosity and integrity to familiarity with the legal environment and ethics wherever you may work, sound knowledge and familiarity aspects from culture to copyright, And of course, the ability to adapt and embrace change and innovation. All this aside from the fact that many journalists work in hostile environments and literally put their lives on the line to speak truth to power. How do you think, not looking just at journalists now, but the broader public, how do we make or help them understand, not only understand, but also empathize with the huge demands made of journalists who are ultimately working in the interests of those very communities? And I certainly found when I moved from journalism to actually starting up, 
straight into media in, in, in 2005, that it was precisely because I was a journalist that I was able to do so many things, you know. Right. Um, I agree with Pointer's um, um, characteristics of a journalist and, and how varied they are. And I think that journalists do a really bad job at marketing our essential role in our democracy, you know. And, and as politics becomes more polarized, um, we're finding greater hostility towards journalists and journalism. And I think in that regard, transparency is one of our underrated tools. I think we need to be sharing the process of journalism with our audiences, um, totally sharing agree. with them you know, the challenges that we have to overcome and the impact that our work has. Um, and we need to do this every day on every platform at our disposal. For example, in South Africa, the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into um, Corruption, for example, would never have happened if investigative journalists in the country hadn't been so persistent and, and just done their work so well. And I think we need to be reminding people all the time what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. Absolutely, and for the public to at least sometimes give credit where it's due. But, but I mm -hmm. absolutely agree with you that, you know, and I think that's really what we're looking at in the new age of journalists, if you, if you like, that we've had to get out of those old ivory towers uh, of the good old days and get down and, and, and meet the people and really find out what they're thinking and find mm -hmm. resonance with those communities and allow them to identify because to kind of put to rest a lot of the suspicion and distrust that seems to be fueled if you look at Afrobarometer surveys and so on, you know, especially across Africa, that many people are distrusting journalists as much as they do politicians and things. And it's, it's frightening to hear that. Yeah, mm. and absolutely. You know, when African journalists are my heroes, every day, somewhere on this continent, a journalist is risking their safety, their health, even their life to bring us stories that matter. Um, and, I, and, and, and they do it under the most difficult circumstances, often with very little credit. Absolutely. And Paula, maybe just to hone in on the issue which you'd mentioned right at the start, which is women journalists. Where are we now, do you think, on the continent in terms of women journalists breaking through, you know, the glass ceiling and are they getting places mm -hmm. and are things becoming easier or more difficult for women journalists? Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you find out with all the young women journalists that you work with? I mean, I think we're making progress, but one of the things that always fascinates me, it doesn't matter where we do the women media management course, whether it's here in Africa or in the Middle East right. or um, in, in, in Asia, you know, um, on the edges, there, there are vast differences. So maybe journalists are scared of being assassinated or they're concerned about specific things. Like, but in the middle, we all share the same challenges in terms of what it's like to manage a newsroom that is predominantly male, what it's like to manage older people, um, what it's like to manage in a very, very patriarchal system. I was watching the launch of the, um, the annual report for women in media, um, and, and, and they were saying um, last week, the research came out, and they were saying that it would take 87 years for the number of, of female sources to equal the number of male sources in media, if we continue on the trajectory that we've been continuing wow. on. Wow. One of, yeah, I mean, it, um, and, and that's in the news, right? So in the news one, um, we're seeing slow progress. So for example, South Africa is globally one of the best countries when it comes to the number of women media managers um, and, and, and senior executives. And, and across Africa, I mean, you know, Pamela Sikoni in, um, in Kenya, um, Barbara Kaji in Uganda, we're seeing more and more women editors. So we're certainly seeing role models, which is one of the ingredients for um, um, to increase the number of women media leaders. But I think we're far from, um, I mean, we, we, we need greater, um, a greater focus on it. Um, we need more training. I think one of the big issues is that very often journalists generally don't get training around media management, um, but very often there are informal networks of mentorship that allow men to actually pick up skills, and we need to create those informal um, um, mentorships for women as well. Um, I think there's progress going, but we, we need a lot more work to make that happen. Unfortunately, we, we need it now when journalism is really packed out. Our newsrooms are depleted. Right. Um, we're still struggling to find business models that work. Um, and, and, and so what you have is small newsrooms across the continent um, and, and business really struggling um, to be sustainable. It's good to hear from that some in newsrooms now, women are 
coming into their own and that there is some progress in terms of their upward mobility in newsrooms. But the other thing that's terribly disturbing right now is the issue of online harassment of in particular mm -hmm. women journalists. If you look at the work that, say, Julie Persetti has done in regard, especially taking the, the online presence of someone like Maria Ressa of the Philippines yeah. and the incredible amount of, of abuse, and she's not the only one, Rana Ayub also, um, incredible amount of abuse. And, and some women that I know of have actually been driven out of those online spaces out because of, of that. Um, how, how do you see that in the African context? Is that also a real problem for women journalists here? So Frey College actually did its own research to see how journalists were using um, um, online. And one of the things that we did find was that while both men and women actually received harassment online, that women were very often targeted in a very sexualized way. Um, and, 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 and it's done deliberately in order to silence women. Right. I mean, we have lots of examples um, all over the continent of women being attacked online, um, and women, um, you know, really having to defend their spaces. And I think, I mean, the, the, one of the things that I would really encourage anyone who's listening to this is that there are lots of online resources, online co courses, the International Women's Media Foundation has Absolutely. an online safety course. And I would encourage women to actually take it um, because there is some research that, that basically shows that the online harassment has sometimes offline consequences uh, sure. and you need to be able to identify when that happens. But at the same time, I think one of the things that Maria has done really well is to stand up and to push back against it, you know, not be silent. I think as soon as we've been silent, as soon as we move away from these spaces, as soon as we refuse to stand up for what we believe in, we actually let the trolls win. And so I think that... Um, the other thing that I would also encourage is that if you see another woman journalist being harassed online, stand up to them as well. Absolutely. I think that when we stand together, we are a lot stronger. Oh, no, I totally agree with that, Paula. And I mean, I think, though, it also takes, you know, a tough character. Not all women journalists are like, mm. you know, thick skinners, perhaps me or... Uh, as, as experienced as you or someone like Maria who mm -hmm. really pushes back all the time. So again, mm -hmm. it's very important, as you say, to stand together and for the, mm -hmm. for the stronger women to, to support others because mm -hmm. it really is awful seeing women, suddenly their, their social media profiles are gone and you know yeah. why. And I, I mean, it's really a great tragedy. Paula, any comment on that quickly? I mean, one of the things that I've also done before is to have a buddy system. So when you have a, a, a colleague or a friend who's being harassed online, you should just to get them offline for a while and for somebody, you know, to, you, to just monitor the, the social media and to do responses, et cetera, when necessary. Because sometimes you just need to distance yourself from there um, as, as much as possible. That's absolutely a good idea. And as I say, we can probably all do with a little break from social media every now and then, <laughs> but especially when one is the target of harassment, mm -hmm. just to take a deep breath and then come back when you feel ready. Paula, as we head towards the end, and I know we could talk for absolute hours on, on, on these and related subjects, but finally perhaps a question that I should have posed to you right at the start, and that is really what do you or how do you see the state of journalism today mm. on our continent? And do you think in general um, our journalists are prepared for the challenges of the future? And if they're not, what do you think, what more can be done? And I know you're doing a lot in the field of training and so are others, what can really be done to, to promote good journalism, which can earn the public trust once again? It's a really good question. Um, um, and I would say that, you know, we live on a continent with incredible diversity. But the one thing we have in common is that our newsrooms are smaller than ever before. Right. And this puts incredible pressure on our journalism. Um, and, and, and anyone that listening to this podcast, I think, will no doubt be able to highlight an example of, of bad journalism in their country. And, and without a doubt, I think that we as journalists need to work hard to reduce that. But I think that what's less visible often are the daily examples of, of journalism that is happening. And we don't celebrate that enough. Um, I want to say that journalism is dynamic. Um, and so we must be constantly vigilant to ensure that our skills match this changing environment. Yes. Because I think sometimes we get left behind. So what we need to do to make sure that our journalists are prepared for the future? I think even with solid foundation, our journalists must be lifelong learners. 
um, the skills of today are not going to be that for next year or for five years' time, or for 10 years' time. And so the idea that you, because you have a journalism degree, that that's it, that, that you, you set, right. um, that doesn't work anymore. No. No. And I think, yeah, and I think when it comes to promoting good journalism that really promotes public trust, um, it, it goes beyond the news. So I think we must not only ensure that our journalism meets the high standards of our editorial codes, but that we also ensure that our journalism institution of self-regulation are, are really strengthened and are able to withstand the pushback again. I think that's the fundamental role of journalism as a public good. Yeah, I think we need to work in the newsroom, but we also need to strengthen our institution. Exactly, and our accountability mechanisms, because in as much as we stand in judgment of politicians Mm. and governments, you know, Mm. we've got to be accountable to our public as well. Mm. Paula, I think you've you've ended that on a great note, and, and I really thank you for taking time to chat today. And don't be surprised, I'm going to come back and talk to you again in the future because I think there's a lot more that that I need to explore with you and to pick your brains and to really share that with others out there. So once again, thank you very much. If you have a final remark, please go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you very much. And I think it's really important that as journalists, we also self-reflect and that we're constantly looking um, at ourselves and what we can do better and how we can do it better. So thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you about it. It is really, really good. Thanks again, Paula. And keep on doing all the good work that you do. It's really making a difference. And that's what's important at the end of the day. All the best. Thank you.